Now on BBC One, Luquesa Burak has this week's Inside Out East Midlands. Tonight, the tiny babies who are beating the odds. It was quite scary to watch, but at the same time you knew they were doing the best for him and without that intervention, without their help, he won't be here. Also tonight, air pollution. Are you worried? Well, take a deep breath. We may have found some good news. Anything that helps sort of promote the fact that electric vehicles aren't this milk float sort of stereotype that a lot of people have is a great thing. And M is for Morris. How this man went from a Derbyshire hill farmer to become the head of MI6. We're in Nottingham to bring you the stories that matter closer to home. This is Inside Out for the East Midlands. Well, first tonight, they're called Miracle Babies, tiny infants born months before their due date. So undeveloped, they're unable to breathe, swallow or cry. Well, new treatments being tested right here in the East Midlands means more of them are surviving against the odds. But pushing back those boundaries comes at a huge cost, not just for the NHS, but also for the long-term health of the babies who do survive. Harry was born four months before his due date at Leicester Royal Infirmary. When it did occur, when obviously she had sort of contractions, I was on the floor crying my eyes out because they tell you it's truthfully how it is. Harry had spent only 23 weeks in his mother's womb. 24 is the legal limit for abortion. He weighed just under a pound. That's less than half a bag of sugar. It was really, really tiny, and like, his skin was really delicate um, and very um, like, near enough see through kind of thing because it was so thin. Premature birth is the biggest killer of babies. Every week, every day that a baby spends inside its mother's womb up to the age of 37 weeks is vital for its survival. Now, like all the babies you can see in this ward, if they're thrust into the world before they're ready, they face some very real and immediate danger. Every day or week that the baby stays inside mummy's tummy, they develop more, so their lungs get more mature, their brain gets more mature, um, and they're much more likely to survive and not have problems when they're born. They also get more um, anti-infection factors from the mother as well, so they're able to fight infection and do better after birth. Well, now advances in the way doctors treat such tiny babies are improving their chances of survival. It means they can tackle some of the heart and bowel problems common in preterm babies. And trials in Leicester and Nottingham are changing the way babies can be fed. We're giving babies lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is a protein that you find naturally in milk and in breast milk and lots in colostrum. We know that it helps to fight infection. Uh, we know that it improves immunity and we know that it can help with the maturation, maturing the gut, so making it easier for them to tolerate their feeds. Ten years ago, a baby born at 26 weeks had a 50% chance of making it. That's now risen to around 80%. Survival rates are improving every year. Leon is one of the lucky babies to benefit from the new science. He arrived almost three months early, and has already survived several life-threatening traumas. Today, he faces another setback. He's been treated for NEC currently, and he's the baby who is weaning off CPAP, and clinically he's stable. Doctors are so worried about his bowels, they've decided to stop feeding him. A generation ago, he'd have had to survive on sugared water and might not have recovered. We were concerned that there might be some kind of infection. So in this situation, he's getting a special nutritional fluids where we can give him carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, all kinds of vitamins and micro elements. And they said they're going to stop feeding him for one week. I just said, mm. but they know they will don't do anything 
they don't want to hurt him, they want to help him. They say it's every day is like a like a roller coaster, you know. One day it's beautiful, we can just have a cuddle and everything, and the other More day it's just can be infection and he have to stay in the incubator and they have to do antibiotics and that kind of stuff. You know? Hope was born four months early at the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham. She weighed a pound and a quarter. I wasn't sure she was going to leave. Like all babies of that age, she couldn't breathe, swallow or cry and had to be fed through a vein. And it was hard yesterday and there have been days when I walked in and she was being helped even to breathe. Many premature babies like Hope are likely to have problems with their sight. New treatments like these to check for and prevent blindness are helping to limit disabilities. Some babies here are so weak that even the air they breathe must be administered by a nurse. In the early days of the NHS, no attempt was made to resuscitate extremely premature babies. Neonatal units were basic and so was the treatment. This one has to be given nourishment with a feeder like a fountain pen filler. The earlier a child is born, the weaker is its hold on life, the greater its helplessness against germs. Now babies can survive after spending just 23 weeks in the womb, but doctors believe we may have reached the viable limit for human life. I think we're probably around the limit of where we are going to get with the smallness of babies. So I don't think there'll be a big progression to resuscitate 22, 21, 20 weekers. And I don't think that's necessarily right. Most neonatologists are not kind of into how small can we get a baby to survive, but more, much more looking at how can we improve the quality of that survival. So we'll just need to get a gas, probably about 15 to 20 minutes. Are you okay doing arterial line gases? Survival rates may be improving, but there are still dozens of possible complications to navigate for every extremely premature baby. So the majority of babies at 23 weeks don't do well. And there's a high risk of um, long-term problems, so developmental problems and conditions like cerebral palsy in those babies that survive at such a small gestation. New research has shown that many premature babies also face mental and behavioural problems as they get older. But actually the most common difficulties premature babies are likely to face as they get older are in the areas of cognition. So difficulties with memory, with thinking, with problem solving, and particular difficulties with attention, and also social emotional problems. And of course those kinds of problems have a major impact on how children perform at school. Only two in ten babies born at 23 weeks survive, and few babies born so early will go on to lead a healthy life. Because so many face lifelong complications, some doctors question the financial cost of treating them. Intensive care is expensive, uh, so intensive care in this hospital costs about £1,000 a day per cot. So if you're testing a new cancer treatment, you say, what is the cost of the drug and how many years extra life will it give someone, uh, quality added life? So. Um, we're one of the only specialties where you can get an entire lifetime. So if a baby does well and they come off the neonatal unit and they, you know, they, they go home and they have a normal life, um, then, then you've gained a huge amount. And that has to be offset against the, the cost up front. Harry is now four months old. He's just reached his due date and has gone home weighing seven and a half pounds. His mum calls him her miracle baby. quite scary to watch but at the same time you knew they were doing the best for him and without that intervention, without their help, he will not be here. They can do amazing stuff now, you know, I mean probably 20 years ago he wouldn't have been here, you know. Hope too has reached her due date and is well enough to go home. And in the same week Leon has recovered from his bowel complications and has finally left hospital. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now we are really really happy to get him at home with us. Really, we don't have to go to hospital, so it's really easier for us. Life is easier. How is he? He's really good. He's a really good boy. He don't sleep in the night time, but that's normal with the baby. Yeah, he's, he's a good boy.
If you look around the unit, you'll see sort of picture boards up with, with pictures of children going to school and of course some pictures of children you know, going on and getting their degree at university that were ex-patients here. And it's very rewarding. So whilst there's a lot to, to lose, um, and it can be a very emotional place from, from that point of view, um, there's also the most to gain. There's no other specialty where you can get 70 years of useful life. huge thank you to all the medical staff and the parents who allowed us to film their stories. Well next tonight it's estimated that air pollution is responsible for shortening our lives by six months. Even worse than that, Nottingham is one of the cities with the dirtiest air. Well, determined to clean up its act, the UK's first priority lane for ultra-low emission vehicles will be opening soon. Well, Simon Hare has been investigating if it'll work and what we can learn from our neighbours in Norway. Imagine going out to your car each morning knowing the tank is full and all at a fraction of the cost of a traditional petrol or diesel vehicle. Well, that's the reality for Simon MacArthur. He's taking me for a drive in his Tesla Model S. It's my first ever time in an electric car. It's quite an expensive car, but the savings I'm making from the fuel, um, the fact that there were some tax benefits, there's no road tax, the stars aligned and uh, it, it seemed like a, a great choice. Not only do you get something that is really nice to drive, really nippy around town, but you also get something that's you know, putting something back into the environment. Yeah, by not putting something in the environment. Oh, <laughs> quite. In the past, drivers in the UK were encouraged to buy diesel cars. But now we're being told they're having a big impact on the quality of the air we breathe. What reaction did you get from family and friends when you when you bought an electric car? Did everybody think you were going to start hugging trees? And uh, not at all. But um, uh, the, the the first sort of uh, office joke was that you're driving around in a milk float, um, which yeah, it got pretty pretty thin that that particular joke. But it, it soon disappeared when they tried to race me away from a set of traffic lights. Um, yeah, like this. Whoa. They were. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it does make a. a, a a big difference in you know, your sort of peer group and what they think of the car, but you know, attitudes are changing. Nottingham City Council is hoping this will change them even further. It's building the UK's first so called eco expressway. As well as buses, the extra lane in either direction on the A612 will be for ultra-low emission vehicles like Simon's electric car. Why is Nottingham at the forefront of this? Well, we all know that uh, air quality is becoming of increasing concern and it's the health risk around uh, emissions. Uh, so we think this sort of initiatives like this will encourage people to uh, buy greener vehicles and that way we'll improve, uh, improve the air that we breathe. So the idea being people coming in from the eastern side of Nottingham stuck in the middle lane in their dirty diesel and they look over and see these electric cars just flying into town, they'll think I'll have one of those instead. That's right, that's the sort of idea. And will mean that they'll get to their destination that little bit quicker. Is that fair? I, th I think it is fair, it would just incentivise in uh, people to get these, these cleaner vehicles which do uh, create benefits for other people. The council has also been investing in its fleet of electric buses. But some campaigners are worried if electric cars do take off here, the knock-on effect could be congested bus lanes. This scheme could be a victim of its own success. So if it succeeds and it attracts very large numbers of electric cars, well then of course the lane will clog up um, and the buses will slow down and the idea is really to persuade people to travel in cleaner ways. Here in Norway, they've been encouraging electric car ownership for years. 
I've come to the capital, Oslo, which is also known as the worldwide capital for plug-in vehicles. Christina, here we have a typical scene in Oslo, cars at the side of the road, but being charged. Yeah, the chargers in Oslo are more or less full all the time. Uh, it's hard to actually find free chargers now. There are more than a thousand of these charging points in the city where drivers can plug in for free. The latest example of how city officials are making it cheaper to go cleaner. Local pollution is a big problem in a lot of cities. Here in Oslo, they even recently banned diesel vehicles from the city centre for a day, when atmospheric conditions saw pollution levels rise dangerously high. Norway is now helping the shift to happen faster, which is very important. Tax and road toll breaks, plus access to bus lanes at peak times, like Nottingham's Eco Expressway, have also helped sales of new plug-in cars to rise. So fast, in fact, they're on the verge of overtaking those of petrol and diesel vehicles. I've come to meet the man who's the driving force behind it all, and he supports what's being done in the East Midlands. Congratulations to Nottingham, because that's a very good way to start. Actually, we did the same, and I, I can assure you that it's just a fantastic feeling going in from the suburbs in the morning and driving in the taxi lane, seeing the queue just standing close to you. But remember that warning from the Nottingham Transport campaigner? Well, there are now so many electric vehicles or EVs here in Oslo that the bus lanes have become congested as well. At the moment, you have to be two persons in an EV during the rush hours. That started late last year, and we can see that it's really getting better. So at the moment, more and more people are driving together, and that's a good thing in itself. It's between seven to nine o'clock. So what do you do? Uh, I take my wife to work. <laughs> nice to use this uh, this lane but uh, I don't think we will uh, have it uh, a very long time because uh, that that many electric cars in Oslo now and uh, we are occupying the lane for the buses and that was not the intention what lessons do you think Nottingham can learn from Oslo there have been some some problems haven't there with buses getting clogged up by electric cars and things yeah, they're probably quite far off uh, that situation in Nottingham still. But first of all, I think it's really good that Nottingham does this. It's, uh, it's those incentives that, that makes the shift start. I think people that are skeptic to an electric car haven't tried one. So with that, the Norwegian Electric Vehicle Owners Association lets me take one of its cars for a spin despite the concerns of my cameraman colleague, Darren. Don't crash. Don't crash, is that what you just said, Darren? Yeah. Thank you. And he was right to be wary. When pulling into that priority lane, I initially failed to see another car. I can see him now. Nearly. It just happened to belong to the National Road Authority. But apart from my dodgy driving, I soon forgot there was anything different about what I was driving. Of course, uh, one electric car would not save the, our world because we have other problems with smoke and other things, you know. But this is the future. It's quiet, it's fast and yeah, it's, it's electric. But finally, from a humble hill farm in North Derbyshire to the head of MI6, Morris Oldfield's career reads like a dramatic work of fiction. Through his uncanny ability to read the next moves of his rivals, he became one of the most respected figures in the history of Britain's intelligence service. But, as I've been discovering, it was his own final career move which for Morris meant there was no happy ending. 1979, it's the height of the Cold War 
and a new BBC drama has audiences glued to their screens. I've got a story to tell you. It's all about spies. And our story is about spies too. Well, one spy in particular. How was it, from humble beginnings, Morris Oldfield, born and brought up here in Overhaddon, a tiny Derbyshire village, was able to go on to become the head of MI6 and the inspiration for Alec Guinness as George Smiley. George Smiley! Oh, you lovely darling man! The Quesa, how lovely to see you. So nice to see you, Patrick. Come on in. Thank you. Pat Thirlby has lived in Overhaddon most of his life. Even as a young boy, Pat says Morris had the makings of a tactical genius. Even when he was at the infant school, the junior school, in the village, he was always the leader. He thought up the ideas, all the scams and things. He, he made the bullets and got the other lads to fire them. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, even in those days, you could realise just how intelligent he was. He was the eldest of 11 children brought up in this cottage. Life wasn't easy for him. The school he went to was a two mile walk each way. But as it turned out, Morris Oldfield was a gifted scholar. His reward for this academic brilliance, a place at the University of Manchester. It was while studying here that he started doing security work in the Middle East which in turn led to him joining MI6. Coming from a Manchester University would still have been something of an outsider inside the service, as most of them came through the Oxbridge route. But Morris Oldfield and the work of a spy proved an excellent fit. Academic qualities, the inquiring mind, actually suited the work that he was doing. I think he did quite close, intense intelligence, collecting information, shifting information, decided what was relevant or not. It was such a good fit that he rose to the very top of MI6. Well, anybody who achieves chief inside MI6 has done exceptionally well because often it's riven by factions. There are other officers who want to get to the top uh, but he achieved it. He got up the greasy pole, as it were, and he made it. And that is a very difficult thing to do. Morris liked to avoid the limelight, but this bookish, quiet character became an unlikely role model. Alec Guinness won worldwide critical acclaim as George Smiley, but first the actor needed inspiration. Control died of a heart attack after a long illness, through most of which he continued to work. Martin Pierce is Morris Oldfield's great nephew and has written a book about him. Hello, nice Hello. you too. He says Morris first met Alec Guinness at a meal with the author, John le Carré. Morris and Alec Guinness got there before him and they were chatting away. And when John le Carré arrived, the first remark that uh, Morris made was, I think he's been uh, overdoing this whole spy nonsense, don't you? And Alec Guinness says, oh, quite agree, Morris, quite agree. Alec Guinness observed. Oldfield very carefully, what he was drinking, how he acted, how he talked, but also he stood and watched Oldfield when he left the restaurant to see how he walked down the road, etc. But being a Secret Service leader wasn't just about mixing with the stars. It was a big challenge at a difficult time. The Burgess McLean affair has raised issues of great delicacy. The Russians knew probably every MI6 officer there was in the 1950s and early 1960s within the service. And that caused great problems with intelligence cooperation with the Americans. Morris managed to calm UK-US relations and became one of the most decorated leaders in MI6's history. Seen from the outside, this is one of the big achievements really in intelligence. None of this acclaim went to his head, though. He was a busy man, obviously head of MI6, but he, was, he had time 
when he got in the local pub in the last kill, always, always spoke, no matter who came in, no matter what standing you were in the world, always spoke. Real nice bloke. Would it be obvious who he was? Not to, not to an outsider, just to people in the village who knew who he was and would just say, oh, morning, Morris, or something like that. But nothing, there'd be no bowing and scraping or anything like that. But just as Morris was about to retire, not to the sun, but to the Derbyshire Hills, Margaret Thatcher asked him to do one more job, coordinating security and intelligence in Northern Ireland. He described it as um, the most miserable time of his career. Not just miserable, those years were to haunt Morris Oldfield's legacy. He died in 1981, then newspaper stories began to emerge, saying he'd been involved in abuse at a Belfast boys' home called Kinkora. You will read claims of state-sponsored child prostitution, paedophile rings, blackmail and cover-ups. The man who blew the whistle on the abuse was a former army intelligence officer, but Colin Wallace is convinced Morris Oldfield was not involved. He was based at uh, Stormont Castle in Belfast, heavily guarded. He did not drive a car, he had no driving licence. He was escorted around uh, with two carloads of bodyguards. So his freedom of movement to interact with people was very, very limited. Now, of course he did, but he was protected all the way he went through. Now, if he had been going to anywhere like Concora or anything of that nature, then those bodyguards would know exactly where he went to and who he met and everything else. Last month, 36 years after his death, the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry, which examined child abuse in Northern Ireland, finally published its findings. It concluded the allegations about Sir Maurice Oldfield's connections with Kinkora have no substance. For his family, though, the damage has already been done. I still feel very angry with the press, I really do. And whoever started all the rumours, which I think Martin's proved, they really aren't true. It's an extraordinary story. The village schoolboy who made it to the top, not through his connections and background, but by sheer hard work and talent. I think he was an astonishing character. To have come from where he did and achieve all the things he did. Well, I think it was, I think everybody was very proud, you know, because uh, let's face it, it's not everybody who rises to be head of MI6. For Martin Pierce, though, it was the fun-loving great-uncle he fondly remembers most. He was always the sort of chap that would, you know, we'd stand in the street and have a chat with you or kick the football against the wall with you and that kind of thing. Um, it was obviously exciting to when the, the press started saying, it's M, he's M, and all the, your mates would go up to him and say, do you know James Bond and all that kind of thing. And he, he would say, oh no, he's off duty at the moment and things like that. You know, he. he he didn't hide what he did at that stage, there was no point, but equally he didn't give anything away either. The remarkable story of a remarkable man. Well, from Nottingham, that's it from us for this week. The FA Cup schedule means we're taking a break next week, but here's what's coming up in a fortnight. With a rise in rough sleepers and street drinkers, is Derby facing a homelessness crisis? I never dreamed that I would actually be homeless. You know, you just don't think it. It can happen to anybody. 